Welcome! This is Beth and Carolyn, your NC Sassanac tour guides. We're doing virtual tours for right now, but plan to have some in-person one-day summer tours this summer as we emerge from COVID. Yes! yes. Woo <laughs> <laughs> More to come on that very soon, so stay tuned. We will be visiting a lot of the places that would have been relevant to when Jamie and Claire would have been here in North Carolina in the 1700s. There are many that aren't mentioned in the books that Jamie and Claire would have known about. We want you to notice right here in this picture how nice, clean, and fresh Carolyn and I appear in this photo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, in the next slide, not so much. So we need to explain our profuse sweating. <laughs> if you are not from Central or Eastern North Carolina or the Southern region of the United States, summer is hot and humid and bug ridden. Oh yes, it is. Mm -hmm. But it is a beautiful time of year to visit Newburn. Um, Newburn is right there on the waterfront. Yeah. It's gorgeous. So please don't avoid going because of the heat. Just come prepared for a typical Eastern North Carolina summer. No one, we're sure, wanted to see us this way, the way we're looking in these pictures. No. <laughs> uh, but at least be thankful that you didn't have to smell us. <laughs> We have Tryon Palace, uh, originally known as the Governor's Palace. It was the official residence and administrative headquarters of the British governors of North Carolina from 1770 to 1775. Season six should feature scenes from the palace as some very important events take place there in the sixth book of the Outlander series, A Breath of Snow and Ashes. We will not disclose those events, but if you haven't read the books, you should definitely um, on, on this slide we will actually see the freeze uh, which is above the entrance to Tryon Palace um, this is King George III's coat of arms um, this is not the original um, freeze the original freeze is located in the North Carolina History Center in Maddox Hall um, the, also, you'll notice in this photo, the, uh, the two photos of, uh, on the left is Governor William Tryon, and over on the right is Governor Martin. Governor Tryon and his wife, Margaret, lived in the palace from 1770 to 1771, and we got to know Governor Tryon quite well in um, seasons four and five of Outlander. That's right. And that's actually a, a sketch of him. Right? That's right. It's yeah, not the original. Sketch. There never was really an, an original sketch. So this is a sketch of him. Yeah. On the right hand side, Governor Martin um, and his wife Elizabeth lived in the palace from 1771 until 1775. Now, we're very excited because we think we're going to probably meet mm -hmm. Governor Martin and his wife in season six because they have a really important role to play yeah. in A Breath of Snow and Ashes. Yeah. Um, the, cur the, the freeze that is located on the palace now is actually a more recent weather durable cast and it's a molded sculptured construct. So it's more durable than the original. Yeah, and that makes sense. Yeah, because in the hot heat, you yeah. know, it would fade. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So cool. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the uh, King's coat of arms. Um, on the top is a lion stadent gardent standing guard atop the imperial crown. On the left side is the Dexter supporter or a lion ready to attack and defend, representing England. The sinister supporter is the unicorn on the right. I don't really get that. I don't either. Um, the unicorn is enchained to the shield and is representing Scotland's subservience to England. A Scottish thistle sits to the side of the unicorn near its tail. The four quadrants of the seal represent various countries that were part of or who had ties to England. In other words, were deemed dependencies, owned fealty and support in times of crisis, and most importantly, tax and other revenues to the crown. Now we're gonna talk about the, the four quarters of the seal mm -hmm. and what they represent. Um, the first quarter, holds three lions passant running on all fours for England, impaled with the Scottish lion rampant. Mm. The second quarter represents France with three fleur-de-lis 
And as you may know, the King of England um, at that time still laid claims to portions of France, and he would eventually cede them back during negotiations, which ended the American Revolution and acknowledged our new nation's status. Those negotiations resulted in the Treaty of Paris in 1783. Hmm. The third quarter, a bardic harp, represents Ireland. And in the lower right, or fourth quarter, you see the Hanoverian features. These include the elector of Hanover's German arms, King Charlemagne's crown, and the easiest feature to distinguish, the Hanoverian white horse. Mm -hmm. um, also of note, George I was the first Hanoverian king. Hmm. Interesting. The additional elements on the coat of arms, um, the red and white Tudor rose, is also known as the Union Rose, which centers five white petals from the White Rose, symbolizing the House of York. And surrounding them are five red petals of the House of York on the lower left outer surround. I'd love to see that close up. I know. Yeah, I yeah. would too. On the banner underneath is the French phrase, Doua mon droit, which translates to God and my right referring to the divine right to rule of kings. The garter belt and buckle that circles the inner king's shield contains another French expression, Hanisois qui mal les Very good. Meaning, shame on him who thinks evil. This expression refers to the order of the garter established by King Edward III and is still in existence today. The reigning monarch, consort, and heir are typically the three prime members and are and all others are appointed by the monarch, having met various criteria and been deemed worthy of becoming a knight or lady or dame of the garter. Very cool. Hmm. Fact versus fiction. Um, on the left hand side, we'll see a sketch of the real governor Tryon. And on the right hand side, there is Governor Tryon portrayed by Tim Downey. Um, there was never an official portrait actually done of Governor Tryon, but this is a sketch someone did of him. Also, if you didn't know, Tim and David Barry, who is our beloved jo Lord John, have a podcast called Outcast, which you can find online. Also, just to let you know, Tryon Palace has right now a virtual event called Savoring Outlander with the Outlander cookbook author, Teresa Carl Sanders, and a question and answer um, segment with Tim Downey. Wow. And we're gonna include that link um, to the Savoring Outlander virtual event uh, being hosted by Tryon Palace down in the link in the, descri in the descriptions. That sounds awesome. It does. We're going to talk a little bit more about the palace. Um, it was designed by John Hawkes, who was recruited by Governor Tryon from Lincolnshire, England. Hawkes oversaw the construction of the palace beginning in 1767, and it was complete enough for the Tryons to move into by 1770. You know, and you think about that, that, that's pretty amazing that they were able to build this huge um, palace um, in three years. Yeah, exactly. Enough for somebody to move into, right. you know, without all the modern equipment That's and everything exactly that we right. have now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the cost to build the palace was approximately 15,000 pounds, um, which equals to be about $20,562 mm -hmm. um, for, the, for the time period for, for then. Um, and it was actually paid for by taxes on the colony. Uh, mm -hmm. And at that time, that would have been a lot of money oh, yeah. collected. So oh, yeah. no, there's no wonder that they, the colonists did not like Governor yeah, Tryon. Yeah, and I, we can certainly understand that. Yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> um, John Hawks actually remained in New Bern uh, after the construction of the palace and until his death in 1790. Mm, so, so he liked it there. He did. He liked our New Bern. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, the original palace, unfortunately, was destroyed in a fire in 1798, so just eight years after um, mm. John Hawkes passed it's, away. He would have been very sad to have oh, seen yeah. that gone up, go up in flames, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. It was actually reconstructed beginning in 1952 using John Hawkes' original plan and finished in 1959. The cost of the reconstruction was quite a bit more at about $3.5 million. Oh my goodness. Wow. That is a lot more than, a what lot was it, 22000 20, 20, compared to $3.5 oh, wow. million? Yeah. Oh my um, unfortunately, uh, after the fire, the only remaining original building is the stables. Mm, that is very sad. It is. But we're glad we had the stables. That's right. And they did a great job with the reconstruction. It's beautiful. Yes, it is. It's gorgeous. As we just previously mentioned, um, Tryon Palace was destroyed by a fire, um, which actually started in um, a cellar and spread to the rest of the remaining building um, in seven, this was in 1798. Um, only the kitchen and the stable wings remained, but the kitchen offices were torn down after the war between the states. The stable office, which you're seeing here, um, is the only remaining part of the original palace complex. And these are the photos of the exterior and uh, interior of the stables. It's very cool. It is. We're excited to have a Tryon Palace expert and a dear friend of mine who did an, an exclusive interview with us. We're going to show that to you now, but we do need to let you know first that the background noise is from cicadas. That's an insect which is prominent in North Carolina during the summer. So you may need to turn up your volume in order to hear the conversation. But here we go. Hello everyone, this is Beth Pittman with Outlander North Carolina and I am so excited to be here today at Tryon Palace with Susan Griffin who is a historic interpreter mm -hmm. And you have been here for quite a number of years, I believe. Two decades at this point, this year. Yeah. Yes, I have. And it's been a wonderful sort of time traveling experience in yes. many ways. <laughs> and we just went on a little tour with you, um, mm -hmm. which was great. It, it was our debut tour of um, A Spark of Rebellion and sort of leading into a bigger, more explosive revolution to come and talking about uh, the regulator movement. Uh, we actually learn a bit more about Governor Tryon's perspective along the route yep. and how people feel now that he's sailed off and we're awaiting a new governor by the name of Josiah Martin. Right. Uh, hopefully it will turn out better. <laughs> <laughs> we hope so. <laughs> now, in the, in the show, mm -hmm. um, when, when Jamie and Claire arrive in the colony, the palace is portrayed as already being completed, but that's not the case. No, it's not. The palace itself, the first building to be constructed was actually the stable office right over here. Okay. And then the kitchen office, and then the palace itself. The stable office was completed in 1769. There was still the argument going over the taxes for it. Uh, the Stamp Act had arrived in 1766, and Governor Tryon was actually up here when riots occurred down there. And a messenger making good time got up here. He, it took him three days and let him know that when he had left Wilmington, his wife and young daughter, who was about six at that time, were surrounded by a torch-wielding protesting mob. So <laughs> Governor Tryon, um, fairly noted horseman himself, made it back to Wilmington in two and a half days. Wow. And he talked down the mob, quelled the riots negotiated. He even at one time offered to pay the tax for all the colonists, but the regulators and others in our elected assembly said, no, we can't allow you to do that. And why would they say no? Well, who knows if a future governor would be willing to pay such a tax if Governor Tryon gets transferred? And what if the tax keeps increasing? Sooner or later, Governor Tryon himself may no longer wish to cover that cost. So they wanted it to be handled with Parliament themselves and it to be legislated out. And that's okay. how it went on. The regulator movement then went on for another, as we now know, five and a half years. And 
As far as Governor Tryon's concerned, it's finished with now. <laughs> now the colonists, um, they lived some, a lot of them in the back country where Jamie and Claire would have lived, would have lived in like maybe a one or two bedroom house. Correct. You're going to get that deed to property. You're going to take whatever belongings, if any, more than clothes and simple tools. Um, go out to where that land is, just as Jamie and Claire had to travel out to it. And you literally, quite literally, are carving your life in the wilderness. You have to know how to plant, you know, chop down the trees. You'll be using sort of sitting on a shaving horse like you saw in the encampment to plane the planks to build the house. I love the Fraser's Ridge cabin, but I have to say, <laughs> wow, that was fast and it's really huge and it has that nice little open sort oh, of space yeah, between their kitchen nice, and yeah. and her um, nice little sort of apothecary medical exactly, surgery. Exactly. It's lovely. So you can understand why some of the backcountry people were very upset when Governor Tryon built this enormous right. house. I mean, this is this is a lot and they're having to pay for something again they haven't asked for. Right. And that's not good. No, nobody wants to. No, no, and they're not able to live that type of life. And he's asking for right, money he's for clearly yeah. loyal to the king. He's doing his job. Um, you know, he was a veteran of the most recent war. Uh, he had retired somewhat from active duty, and now he's taken up a governance in the new way. And so he's hoping to gain that. Right now, we are in the Latham Garden. Is that correct, Susan? Yes. Here at Tryon, and it is absolutely beautiful. And you can probably hear the cicadas that are going crazy right now. But can you tell us a little bit more about this garden, um, the design, and and all that? Well, the garden is actually dedicated to the Queen Chimad Mora Latham, um, and she was one of the original sort of six ladies who truly worked hard to do the research, get the funding, and everything else to restore the stable office first, and then reconstruct the palace itself. And it opened its doors to the public in 1959. So again, we've had a lot of big anniversaries last year in 2019. For the original palace, the, the stable office was constructed in um, 1769. So 250 years of witnessing North Carolinians and others, you know, walking through in between its walls. The gardens themselves are sort of based on very good 18th century um, known practices and a bit on what John Hawks, the architect, had designed or hoped would be here. But again, a series of events will happen very quickly after this, and really the only formal garden that was in existence would have been the kitchen office. They needed that for produce to provide for their kitchen, and medicinal plants, and things yeah. of that nature. Yeah. So, all of these gardens look very pretty, but they weren't actually they here weren't in the year. Yeah, and then the palace burned out in 1798, and we had a new capital called Raleigh, so yeah. there was no sort of... So did the design. family, uh, Tryon's family, or Martin's fa Governor Martin's family, or did they, did they ever... Where did they go when they They would outside? have strolled, uh, again, there's, as you saw at one station today, a lovely sort of brick patio area right off the drawing room. So okay. it really means that summer you've had your windows open all day because it's air conditioning. Now there's a cool breeze coming off the track. Okay. So tables, chairs could have been put out there. And there would have been little side paths down towards the river they could walk. And I have no doubt that they did their best to ornament them. It just would have been the same formal things that you see today. More like the wilderness area portion of our garden with the path okay. through more local plants and magnolia trees, things like that. Right. I can kind of see them in my mind. It'd be like, um, just like when they're walking, walking along through the, the near river run yeah, and things like yeah. that. I can see that, so it's really neat. Um, now the brick walls that are around um, the garden, uh, do they hold any special uh, purpose? Or? Uh, well, the walls are actually going to do several things. Uh, they're made of clay, and in the sun, they're going to absorb heat. And that will radiate in several ways. It'll radiate and keep the air temperature warmer. Uh, the brick pathways between the plants helps to keep the roots a little warmer. And you're going to be able to grow a little bit longer than you could. Um, if you grew up in the New England food, food was hard to come by. And we were much more fortunate as colonists. Um, our growing season, especially in eastern North Carolina, can sometimes extend all winter. You might have to take some little smudge pots out to keep some of the fruit trees if you've left them out. 
um, warm, but it, the root crops will go well, and most of the surface crops like kale and cabbage, and of course the more traditional, as we can say now, collards, oh, yes. all of those things do well here. Uh, you'll find broccoli growing in, in October if you come in, and a host of other plants. Alright, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to move to the south wall, I believe? Yes, we are. I think we should go down and see a cannon before we leave. Let's Don't do you? that. We're back, and right now we're in front of um, the cannon mm -hmm. here, and this is the Neuse River, right? This is actually the Trent. The Trent, yes, and it meets up with the Neuse. If you can over that way, you'll see the big, huge bridge on the left. That is where the, the Neuse River is. So and the Neuse River was just like the New River and others. It was a main waterway, and you could get faster going east to west by getting on the water. Okay. The roads, the further west you go, are pretty rough. And, um, you know, put it on a raft or a boat and then pull your way up river, just as we saw them in the exactly. um, drums of autumn. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I knew there was a confluence of the two rivers. Uh, I didn't realize this was a plant, but it gets up with the Pamlico and then yeah. goes to the ocean from there. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Got it. And <laughs> that's part of the feature of the location for Governor Tryon. Again, he had a military career before he came here. His wife, Margaret, um, although we didn't see a lot of her in the series, also wrote a small work on fortifications because her father had actually um, served in India under George II as Lord Governor of Bombay, or as today you would call it, Mumbai. And mm -hmm. he redid the fortifications of the English holdings there, negotiated treaties um, with the natives, just like Governor Tron will do in North Carolina. And when he's picking a location to build a government house that he was, you know, asked by the king to do, well, this is great. It's 45 miles inland, up a shallow river, mm -hmm. and then you have to, you know, go off to the left if you're coming up river, and uh, into the Trent in order to even get to the palace. So the French and the Spanish warships probably wouldn't be able to make it up here very well. Wilmington is very right on the water. Uh, good captain could probably load cannons and fire right into downtown. Right. right. That wouldn't be good. No. <laughs> so so it was the perfect spot for Governor Tryon. Mm -hmm. Now Jane and Governor Tryon, as much as we hate to admit it, do have some similarities in their military background. Yes. So Jamie's are a little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie's gone through a lot more than Governor Tryon has. Because Governor Tryon is actually about a decade younger than Jamie. And so Jamie would have been a child, actually, um, during the 45 Rebellion. And where is Jamie as William Tryon enters into the military? He's actually living in the cave still there. And you've okay. sort of seen sort of all right. of that side right. of Jamie's perspective. Governor Tryon has entered the military. Um, he gets married uh, just after the outset of the French and Indian War. And he goes into active service. And he goes through some really traumatic experiences, we would say, today. There's a couple of letters in his two-volume set of correspondence that let you know about the details of that. He had to write reports the immediate morning after uh, a particularly devastating one where he had last seen one of his friends. Just, mm -hmm. he, he didn't know what had happened to him. Some had been taken prisoner, but nearly half of their deployed troops had been killed in the battle. So he was still uncertain as to where his friend was. So I think that's something that he and Jamie have in common. But they're obviously on sort of opposing sides. Now when Jamie arrives here, Tryon has obviously been here a couple of years. He's been here since 1764. Um, he's dealt with, as we discussed earlier, some of the more contentious politicians of the day who aren't really certain that we need a capital. And now he's going to go forward. We've seen his military career here, but his biggest military career has yet to come. Um, because after governing New York, he will become Brigadier General William Tryon. So his main station will be on Long Island, but he is going to con conduct raids into the heart of New York and Connecticut and a host of other regions and cause great devastation in his way. And I'm from Connecticut. I understand all of that because I was also alive during the bicentennial and as a teenager I was standing in Ridgefield waiting for Governor Tryon to come down from Danbury on his way. The defending officer at that battle by the way 
was Benedict Arnold. Oh. It was one of his good movements. <laughs> um, we who are Connecticut Yankees like to laud him up until that last moment. Although we don't vilify him for West Point, we vilify him for something later that comes afterwards. Um, for a brief period, Benedict Arnold, after he turns, is actually sort of there on Long Island, and William Tryon is one of three other officers that are supposed to be sort of keeping an eye on him. And then Arnold will prove his loyalty to the Crown by going up the Thames, not the Thames, the Thames River of New London, Connecticut, <laughs> rather than London, England. And he will, there will be troops, 800 or so, on either side, the New London side and the Broughton side of the river. There'll be a massacre at both defending forts, and it actually occurs in um, 1781. It's one of the last big battles, mm -hmm. and it, it again proves great hardship to Connecticut itself. And so, uh, this Connecticut Yankee understands North Carolinians' resentment of Tryon when you look at history and <laughs> textbooks. On the one hand, he's doing his job. If you're English, you're saying he did pretty good, all things considered. But if you're an American and you're looking back at American colonial history, he is to be vilified. And in fact, there was a preacher who wanted that in New London. Governor William Tryon, late of North Carolina, and the vile actions which he led there, is newly arrived as a neighboring royal governor of New York. And so, and then the preacher goes on to talk about other things that I do believe Herman Husband would have been in full agreement with. <laughs> and those are all sorts of things that you can look into more and hopefully we'll hear more about at future time. Right. Well, tell me, um, did Governor Tryon did he finally go back to England? Yes, he does. He'll go back. Um, he ends up with a nice little pension. He and his wife do fairly well. He passed in 1780. Or 88, and then Margaret will live on into her elderly years. Their daughter, young Margaret, unfortunately passed, and that's a whole other tragic story. I won't go into the details okay. now, but you okay. can look up what happened yeah. to young Margaret Tryon okay. as well. Okay. Things happened to her in New York, and then and then in England. Okay, that sounds like an interesting story. It is, <laughs> but you'll have to find it on your own. Okay. I'm a civics teacher. I want you to do your research and read it. And that's what I also uh, credit Outlander with doing. It's allowed a lot of people oh. through fiction, yes, but so much of the actual factual history is in it. That well, it lends well to us. Yes, and that's kind of the journey that it took me on, was that the, what was written in the books just inspired me to get online or go and, and find the real history, which has, and I think that's happened to a lot of Alabama fans. Well, I think as you, as you say earlier, our textbooks sort of give the more louder on parchment. We have lots of printing presses, New England, three mid Atlantic story. Uh, there was only one printing press in North Carolina. Clearly, we had to write letters into the Virginia papers and elsewhere to say, uh, what he said about what happened in Alabama exactly how we feel about things and we're not 100% sure that it's completely over yet but we're going to wait for this new Governor Martin to come in and, and see what happens and right. how it goes. Right. We're be willing to give him a, a couple of years. <laughs> and we're going to be seeing um, Governor Martin um, uh, next season. Right, the breath of snow and ashes. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm excited, yeah. I don't know about you. Yeah, I am. Because, and, uh, We'll see more of the Frazier family in Yes, we will. Not, not Great. Spoil it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We won't say too much, but yeah, looking forward to that. But let me tell you, yes, I can say it here. I, it is kind of a spoiler. I've walked in Claire's footsteps now. <laughs> yes, she really has. So have you now. <laughs> I know. And that's so really neat. So I really, you know, I always encourage people to get out and, and see the history for yourself, you know. Come find out the other it. side of the real story. Yeah, that's right. I think you'll be just as interested in it. And the love stories, uh, as there are quite a number of young love stories and older ones, um, if you come here to the palace, we'd be happy to share with you. Right. So I think that kind of wraps it up for today, Susan. I really appreciate you doing this for us, and um, I'm looking forward to being able to share it with my group and on my Outlander North Carolina page, and um, it's going to become
become a part of our virtual tour. So I really do appreciate it. And I encourage all of you to come to Tryon Palace, come to Newburgh, but come to Tryon Palace. Um, that you're going to be having tours uh, out all the way tours. through November. Okay. Um, it's designed to be outdoors. Bring your umbrella or parasol. Uh, comfortable walking shoes, but if you have mobility issues, we can definitely help you get around from place to place. And we'll be waiting for you, ready to tell you the rest of the story. Right. Well, not all of it, <laughs> but some of it. <laughs> and thank you for coming. Oh, back. thank I mean, you. You thank were you. with me up at Alamance a couple of times. And I it's know. Been really it's wonderful. Been fun. I know. Getting to know. Looking at your pages <laughs> and information too. Well, thank you, Susan. And um, that that finishes us up for today. Um, so we're going to say so long uh, from Tryon Palace. Thank you, Susan. All right, and good day and safe travels. Hopefully I'll see you in the future. <laughs> so as we said a few minutes ago, cicadas that you just heard um, are definitely prominent and make a lot of noise. And just look how big they are. Uh, there's one there beside Beth's hand. Um, and no wonder they make so much noise because they're huge. They are huge. <laughs> <laughs> so um, next we have Governor Tryon's groom, um, who was there as a part of the tour that we did. Right. Um, and 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 below that we have an apothecary. Then beside he would have that, been a friend of Claire's. Oh right? yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Okay. You can cure what ails you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, beside that we've got the town gossips. Um, then to the right of that is Susan in front of the stables while she was addressing our tour group. She did a great job. She did. She did a wonderful job. So in this picture, I want to start on the right. That is a picture of the gates from inside the palace looking out. Uh, then on the left, this actually is not a part of the palace grounds, but this is a building we took a picture of while we were there just because of its age. It, it's um, property there in New Bern dated back to the 1700s, and it's just the coolest looking place. It is, and and the thing is, is that there are a lot of places in New Bern that are still standing yeah. from that era, and this was just one of them. Yeah, and you just want to know the history. I know, of I know. You think about who walked in and out yeah, of those doors. And, and I'd love to go inside. So. I know, me too. These are just a couple of additional pictures that we took. Um, actually, what you're seeing here, in, just from two different angles, is the kitchen wing of Tryon Palace. And you see the cupola up there over the top of the bushes, but that's actually the kitchen wing there. Now we want to talk a little bit about the gardens. There are more than 16 acres of gardens and landscapes at the palace including a kitchen garden that offers a variety of produce throughout the year. In the center, you'll see uh, an entrance into the house from the gardens. To the right, uh, the beautiful Latham garden named after Maud Moore Latham. She was a driving force of the restoration of the palace. She passed away before the reconstruction was complete, but her daughter, Mary Gordon Kellenberger, stepped in to help guide the project. And that's just beautiful. Lady. It is. That really? garden. Yeah, just to walk through that. Uh, it's just wonderful. And they have like, you can buy a ticket for just a garden tour, oh, which yeah. is really nice. Yeah. And I would think kids really love running around oh, yeah. through that. Oh, yeah. Maze there. That's right. <laughs> so if you know Beth and you know me, and when we get together, we have a lot of fun. We do. But where there's fun, there are also going to be boo-boos. Right. <laughs> we have a lot of those. In addition to tripping, falling, That's right. bruises, scratches, <laughs> <laughs> running into things. That's right. Running into each other. <laughs> But since we had so much fun, we just thought we'd share a few of our little bloopers with you. Is it going? Yeah! <laughs> so all of that allows us to have food. I'm kidding. We're saying, sorry, sorry, <laughs> and I'm doing it. Testing, one, two, three. I'm so happy to be here with you today, Beth. Thank you for interviewing me. Oh, well, you're so welcome, Carolyn. I'm sorry I'm sweating like a pig. <laughs> Not as bad as I am. Okay, cut. <laughs>
Try On Palace's mission is to engage present and future generations in the history of North Carolina and its important contribution to American history, and that is very significant. Your generous tax-deductible contribution to the Tryon Palace Foundation Annual Fund will enable the palace to grow their educational programming, historical interpretation, and more. Links to make a donation are going to be in the description for this video. Um, please consider a donation. It will be well worth your money um, to help Tryon Palace keep what they have for generations to come. That's right, that's right. So if you'll go to their website at www.tryonpalace.org slash calendar, they have a lot of exciting events on there. So please go over there when you get a chance and just Absolutely. browse through their events and, and their website and check out what they have. Um, but we do want to bring your attention to the Outlander, the Spark of Rebellion outdoor tour, mm -hmm. uh, which is the one we went on while we were there to make this video. Yeah, and it was great. Yeah, it, it was. And they're only $20 per person. Mm -hmm. Person. Yeah, Wonderful. for the tickets. Yeah. Um, in this tour, you will join a group of time travelers to Tryon Palace, the colonial capital of New Bern, circa 1770s. There you will encounter the royal governor's militia, and while warming up by their campfire, except for not in August. No, not in August. <laughs> you'll learn the latest news on the colony. There are whispers of discontent and unrest among the colonists. Those regulators are getting stirred up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your travels will also take you to meet a local physic and surgeon who is an acquaintance of Claire's mm. for consultation on some of his healing remedies, as well as other traveling through time. Mm. Mm. Others traveling to, okay, interesting. Uh -huh. uh, we do want to make sure that you know it's an outdoor tour, so you do need to dress accordingly depending on how the weather is. That's right. Um, it is designed to address special needs items such as walkers and wheelchairs. Uh, tickets are limited to online purchase. Right, and we do highly recommend that if you go in the summer that you dress very lightly. Yes, not definitely. Don't run around, try on naked, but <laughs> get as layered down as you can because you don't... Yeah, you know, lightweight clothing. Very lightweight clothing. Yeah. We just want to thank all of you so much for taking this journey with us. It's been months in the making, seriously, mm -hmm. right, Carolyn? Yes, it has. We went last August, and I now know. we're just finally doing this. Yeah. Um, but we sincerely hope that you enjoyed it as much as, as we did. Uh, we highly recommend going to Tryon Palace and seeing it for yourself. Yes. It's a great place to visit, learn history, um, meet a lot of uh, interesting people and yeah, characters. That's right. That's right. And talk Outlander, too. That's right, because <laughs> they're all Outlander fans Yeah. There. Um, and we also would really appreciate any feedback that you might have. So um, if you'd like to offer some feedback, we'd love to hear it. Please feel free mm -hmm. to email us at info at ncsassanactours.com. Um, also, if you'd like, you can leave us, a, uh, leave us a review on our Facebook page at NC Sassanac Tours. Mm -hmm. And we promise we won't cry if you leave us a not-so-good review, but we will probably <laughs> bury our heads under pillows for days. So. But, <laughs> no, seriously, we do want you to leave your honest um, feedback or reviews, and we yeah. would really appreciate that. Yeah, we would. Also, we, want you to, we would like for you if, you, if you're interested in our own Instagram, to follow us on our Instagram page at nc underscore sassanac underscore tours. So Carolyn, I've been looking over the pronunciations here on these slides, okay. you know, the things that we need to tell people. And um, I, I, the first one um, on slide seven is Lion Stadent Garden. Okay. That's the way that's pronounced. Lion Stadent Garden. Right. Um, let's see. Um, da, 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 da. What about the one at the top there? Oh, the first paragraph. That, uh, fr it looks like frise, but it's it's pronounced freeze. Okay. Tryon Palace freeze. Right. Right. Okay. okay. And then um, on the next page, the first quarter holds three lines. Passant is how that's passant. Or passant. 
Let's see. <laughs> I don't remember. Hold on. Uh, let's see here. Well. Uh, let's see. Passant. 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 Okay. Okay. Passant. All right. Um, the next paragraph is the floor de lis, ah, but I have no idea. Okay. Uh, I've never really been able to say that word. Me either. Fleur de lis. Fleur de lis. Fleur de lis. Can you hear the S? Hold on. Oh, wonderful. This is to be the Frenchman. Bonjour. <laughs> Bonjour, too, to you. <laughs> Let's see. Hold on. I'm not where I was. Let's see. Um, Fleur de lis. Fleur de lis. Fleur de lis or Fleur de lis. <laughs> Listen, okay, this is how it's pronounced. Fleur de lis. Okay. Fleur de lis. So the S is silent. Sounds, well, I didn't hear that, did mm -mm. you? Uh -uh. Fleur de lis. Okay, all right. Fleur de lis. Right, all right. And, okay. Um, okay, we've got some French phrases that we have to pronounce. Um, the first one is duet mon droit. This is what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Star Wars. <laughs> Droids. Droids. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we can um, look this one up and get a pronunciation. Dieu est mon droit. <laughs> <laughs> Might need to do that again. I, okay, let me play it one more time. Dieu est mon droit. Dieu est mon, mon droit. <laughs> You did good. I was gonna say do a mandroy. <laughs> do a mandroy. Do a. Do a. Let's listen. Do a mandroy. Do a mandroy. It's like D W A. Droit. Yeah. Droit. Do we just do let him do it? <laughs> <laughs> we might. We might just say this is the way it's really supposed to be. Do a mandroy. Do a. Do a. Do a mandroy. Do a mon mon. It's more like a mon. Mandois. 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 Okay. All right. And. Oh my goodness. Look at the next one. Oh dear. Okay. Let me type this one in. Oh no. We'll never get this one. <laughs> <laughs> it's got too many words. It's too for many one words. Thing. All right. All right. So this is our words describing right. the coat of arms. That's right. Or certain things in the coat uh -huh, of arms. Uh-huh, uh-huh, at Zion Palace. Yeah. So, okay, I've got this one pulled up. All right, let's listen carefully. On soir qui m'a réponse. There's no <laughs> way. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, soit qui m'a réponse. <laughs> Honey, soit qui mali pense. Honey, soit qui mali pense. Honey, soit. Honey, soit. Honey, soit qui mali pense. Honey, soit. Is it qui or qui? Honey, soit qui mali pense. Qui mali, mali, kind of like mali, right? Yeah. Honey, soit qui mali pense. Mali pense. Mali pense. Pons. How would you spell that? Pons. P O N C E. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Pony. And there's no Pony sound. Qui m'a les pons. Right. Very good. Pony soir qui m'a les pons. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you're cursing. I know. Holy soir. <laughs> Ma 
Holly Pont. <laughs> but we've got to say it fast, Carol. I know. Holy swaki, Molly Pont. That was good. <laughs> Holy swaki, Molly Pont. <laughs> Let's see if we can say it three times in a row fast. Honey swaki, swaki Molly Pont. Honey swaki, swaki Molly Pont. <laughs> You can take that one. Uh, you gotta have attitude. Holy swaki molly pots. You gotta have French attitude. Honey swaki molly pots. Okay. Okay, what would be the southern way? Um holy no honey holy, honey, honey, honey soy what qui ma why pence. That's right. <laughs> honey, honey swat so soy soy. Kiwi Mal E Pence. Yep. Honey Soy Ki Mal E Pence. Mal Y. Mal Y. That's exactly right. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I hope they don't have any more that are harder than that, to be sure. Oh, I hope not. Okay. All right. Let's see here. I think this goes over here. Okay, so let's look at this one. No, that looks, maybe that, I think that's the hardest things, you think? I think so. We better make sure though. Um. Okay. You see anything else that might trip us up? And then we'll go back and we'll rehearse one more time. Okay. We good? I think we're good. Okay. I think we're ready. All right. All right. Okay, let's let's go over these words again. <laughs> All right. Start on seven. Uh-huh. Oops. Okay. All right. Try on palace. Freeze. Freeze. That's right. And then a uh, lion statement state garden garden state it garden uh -huh. right and then pass it we said it was not passant that's right that's passant 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 and then fleur de lis uh, fleur de lis fleur de lis very good Carolyn I, um, I made notes <laughs> I didn't, as you can tell. <laughs> All right, here we go with the French phrase. Oh, no. Du Dua mandoua. Duet mandra. Dua, du Dua mandoua. I didn't do it. I, I don't remember hearing Duet. That. Dua. I, didn't, I don't remember Duet hearing mandoua. that. Et. Okay, maybe the. Et Dua is. mandoua is what I wrote down okay. in my um, okay. southern interpretation. <laughs> Let's, let's hear him do it again. Dua mandoua. Dua mandoua. Yeah. You're right. Okay. You don't even hear that. No, yeah. the E. Dua, Dua, Dua mandoua. mandoua. Okay. Mandoua. It's more of a moon. Mm. <laughs> moon. Like your eggs. Mom. Mom. Dua mom. Moon. Like you, you got an egg mm. in your mouth. Moon. Yeah. Dua mon <laughs> mon. <laughs> And the next one is our our, our new curse word. Honey swa ki male pon. What's the guy on Beauty and the Beast? The Camelot? Oh yeah. Uh, what's his name? Holy sma holy swa ki male <laughs> What's his name? Uh, something Albert 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 Albert. Or be, uh, I don't remember. What's his name? Now you know I have Google to look it. that up. <laughs> <laughs> I've got I can, loved him. Candlestick and Beauty and the Beast. I loved him. Lumiere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how you pronounce his name? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Tony. Honey swa qui m'a les pants. Honey swa qui m'a les pants. Okay. All right. Well, is it pants? It's pants. I'm yes, saying pants. It's not, it's not, well, yep. it could be pants. I think it's pants. It's probably pants. Like pons. your mouth is full. Yeah. Again. Pants. Which right. means, uh huh. Shame on him who thinks evil. So I wonder if you only say honey swa as a cuss word, does that just mean <laughs> shame, shame on you? Well, or, shame on him. Yeah. Yeah. 
when you swap when you swap key molly pops let's google what home what is just the first two just words just when you swap yeah swat <laughs> swat team <laughs> h-o-n-i swat right mm -hmm. oh, i spelled it wrong just that it means uh, uh it doesn't break it honey is uh it just gives the whole phrase okay 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 so. Well, okay. All right. Okay. Okay. I think we are ready.